inlays. They impart to the viewer that time was taken, meticulous patience was polished, and fine skills were at hand. And this will be no exception. I want to show you how to achieve absolutely flawless inlays with a technique that you won't need a CNC for. This gothic architecture inspired dining table is my most recent personal design and will be the feature of this video series, with this inlay video as part one. And to take the Bolivian rosewood tabletop to the next level, I'd like to add a pattern inlay consisting of two brass strips and three ebony purfling strips to add more dimension and interest. The pattern will repeat and weave into the next as any leafs are added, so the purfling will have to line up on the joints. Purfling is best known in the art of loose or stringed instrument building, when the artist adds a decorative border around the rim of the soundboard, like this violin that I built, or adding multiple strips for binding such as on this acoustic that I also built years ago. So how are these thin strips even made? How do I route such perfect grooves for them to inlay into? And how do I achieve all of this while remaining consistent with my pattern? Because I'm going to be repeating this four times. The first step to answering some of these questions is building a reliable jig. Each part of this process will be most accurate if everything is dead on square. I check with the square and feeler gauges, but the most important part, no matter how you do it, is that your end product is consistent. This jig will be a guide for my router base. It consists of an outer barrier that contains the jig itself. We will get into why this is important later. Then a first component that slips in, followed by two different jigs that collaborate with this panel in order to cut the different types of cuts. I'm telling you, this is genius and it solves a lot of problems when it comes to routing inlays and patterns in general, so let's continue. The perfect center can be found by drawing lines from corner to corner. With the router and bit you are using, set it on a template and mark where the base is. Then reference that mark from the center using a compass. Now transfer that to the board. I'm also marking the pattern itself on the board so I can reference it if I need to, although this will be cut away in a minute. On a separate duplicate panel, set up a router with a straight cutting bit and cut within that same circle. This will be one of the guide panels. Now cut the inner edge that the other side of the router base will ride against. Notice how I only cut about halfway through here. That's because I will only be able to utilize two opposing corners of this jig at a time, and you'll see why. So make some cuts where you want the router to start and stop, then use a flush trim bit to cut those two sections out. You can see here the two channels that are cut out for the router. The other two corners are remaining as stops for the base plate. The pattern that I chose is a Celtic shield knot. It will symbolically protect our home and offer a conversation starter for any guests that we have over. But that's not the only reason we chose this pattern. It's helpful because it's essentially one pattern replicated four times to create a weave. Then that pattern as a whole will be replicated four more times across the panels of the tabletop. So on the jig, this panel will serve as the arc cuts. Let's call this the arc jig. We will cut two arcs, then spin the jig 90 degrees and cut the next two. In order for this jig to work though, we have to accurately cut the panel that will house the separate patterns. We will call this the barrier. I just use some OSB for this since I have it laying around and for my design it requires nearly a half sheet. I mark where the base panel will go, then a track saw is easiest to cut it out. You can use a jigsaw or even a skill saw. And with a few pieces of clear tape on the base panel, I've reached a perfect fit. Mark the orientation so you can reposition it the same every time. Each detail like this will help reduce human error because we need this to be accurate down to the thousandth of an inch. The arc jig is pinned to the base with one nail in the dead center, and a nail in one corner to keep it from turning. Now we can actually route the grooves through the base. Thankfully we can see the accuracy since the pattern is drawn below. There are two choices you can make when building this jig. One choice is to use a router bit that is the correct size for the groove you want, but you will be obligated to this size of groove. Your router will have to ride perfectly in its track with zero play, and there will be no way to fine tune the width of anything. Or in my case, I am using a bit that is smaller than the size I want, then I will run the router forward against one wall, then back against the other. This creates the perfect size groove I want and allows for fine tuning and more options. So here I am doing just that. 
The arrow tells me what orientation to hold the router in, and I can run it forward and back, cutting at half depth. Then the other side can be routed the same. Now the pin can be pulled and the arc jig can be spun into position 2 to cut the other two corners. With all four arcs done, it's time to create the straight cuts. With the base panel temporarily raised up, I can mount an outer frame that will contain the straight panels that will produce the rest of the pattern. These are two different panels that create an off-centered track for the router. One stop at the beginning and one stop at the end will serve as, well, stops for the cutting process so I don't go too far. Here's more of what I think to be the true genius of this design. I can just install the boards 90 degrees from the last position each time until all four cuts are made. And booyah, there it is, a Celtic shield knot. I want to get a bit closer on those corners though, so a quick trim of the stops and a few pieces to guide the back of the router since there is an adjustment screw back there. The stops can be mounted permanently to the straight cut jig. Then a full depth cut can be finished in the base panel. Some of the components will be cut free at this point, so don't forget to pin or brad nail them to the jig above so they remain as part of that jig. You can see some of them here. So we're about to move on to the second part of the video where we actually test the cut, we create purfling strips, and we actually do inlays into the table. But you might be saying, hey doofus, you realize you don't even need the barrier? You can just double-sided tape the jig to the tabletop. Then you won't be wasting plywood. And to that I say, you're right. And you're a little wrong too, because oftentimes when routing patterns, if you double-sided tape them, they can move a tiny bit. Okay, big deal. I'll just use carpet tape and that thing won't move a millimeter. Well, what happens if you pull the template, and of course, you forgot to cut one of the sections? You'll be in a world of hurt, because good luck getting that template back into its original position. And if you go to put your inlay in and you realize the groove is a touch too tight, you can certainly alter your jig to make a correct fit, but once again, you won't be able to position it accurately again. The barrier serves as a way to not only place the jig where you want it, but pull the jig if you need to, Test the fit of your inlay, then you can pull the barrier as long as you're 100% with the decisions you've made. I run a quick test on some maple to make sure all of my grooves are a consistent width, which they aren't. The smallest groove though is 0.2 inches or 5.2 millimeters. So I just add some tape to various locations on the jig which will micro adjust the router and give me slightly smaller grooves to match the smallest one. With that fine-tuned, we can make the strips that will produce the beautiful inlay. Ebony will serve as the purfling, and there are several different grades. The darkest and cleanest is first grade, or grade A. The ebony next to it is second grade, or grade B, because it has lighter streaks running through it. I don't have enough of the grade A, so I will opt for the darker portion of the B grade board. This board actually cost me nearly $100 alone, and I want nothing wasted. It may have quite a light color in this footage, but once the table has finish on it, the purfling will be pitch black. I cut strips off of the edge of the board as opposed to the face because it will conserve wood and I'll only use about half of this board anyways. To thickness them, I add some tack to an MDF panel to stick them to. Just enough for some tack, but not enough to leave residue on the strips. Then I can carefully run them through the drum sander. There are other ways to create thickness strips using a hand plane or even a table saw, but I find this the most consistent down to the thousandth of an inch. Now the strips can be stacked and cut to final height on the bandsaw. For the brass, you may be asking, how in the heck do I cut it? Simple answer, the exact same way. With a slow feed rate and a 6 TPI or more wood blade, it will do just fine. Cut your strips so that they protrude from the top of your groove just a tiny bit. The bandsaw has a smidge of drift and leaves rough cuts that you want to be able to sand away. The brass will get burrs, so cleaning them up with a sanding block is crucial. 
It's time to take a big freaking breath because we're about to cut into very expensive Bolivian rosewood and I started with a mistake and you'll see why and how to correct it. I somehow think I'm genius by leaving a tiny gap in between the two panels. That way I can fit a saw in so I can cut the inlay apart later. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. But comment below if you see the problem this will pose. With a stop connected to the end of the barrier panel, the diamond is positioned dead center with the joint of the two tabletop panels. Then with clamps holding both of those panels to the barrier, I can begin the process we've already discussed. Just remember to collect that dust as you go, otherwise it will throw off the depth and possibly the width of your grooves. Then the straight cuts can be finished and would you look at that? Everything is perfect because we spent so much time on the jig. But that obviously doesn't divulge the problem yet. I did get a skosh of tear out on a few of the corners and one small nick, but no big deal. Now the first strips can be placed. A perfect way of holding them together is with a miter spring clamp. As I mentioned in my last video, I will link these in the description because they sure come in handy. The orientation is two ebony strips on the outer edges and two strips of brass on the inside separated by a very thin strip of ebony. To mark where the miter needs to be cut, I use a saw with a very small kerf, then do a rough cut on the bandsaw and slip it into a jig that guides me for the correct angle. This Laguna strip sander makes quick work of refining the angle. Thank you Laguna for providing this awesome edge sander as well as a very quiet spindle sander. These sanders will contribute heavily to the intricate design and curves of this dining table build and many projects to come. Take your time and get a perfect fit. They should barely slide in with some friction. For the arc inlays, I made this jig that will let me accurately bend each brass strip to the correct radius. The ebony strips can be added, then everything is rough cut at the bandsaw using another holding jig. This lets me accurately sand both ends of the miters while holding the inlay in its curved position. And since the grooves are all so accurate, they fit perfectly every time. No fuss, no muss. It seems to be easier to start with the miter and end with the straight cut, but that's just a common practice in many aspects of woodworking in general. I could have pre-glued these strips together, some in the straight orientation and some in the arced form, then I wouldn't have to deal with this problem. Oh my. But I find when I pre-glue the strips together, I can come out with inconsistent thicknesses. Also, the miter has to be absurdly perfect if they are glued together, but when they are separate, if each one is off slightly, I can still push each individual strip tightly to its mating end. And even from a reasonably close distance, the joint will still look fantastic. As I continue each section for my first pattern, I get faster and more accurate. Now that I know everything fits, I can officially pull the barrier. Since I had a tiny smidge of tear out, I can now fill those sections with a matching wood dust because we will be using a thin CA glue as the adhesive. I also pulled this one piece because the next cut will actually overlap it. Thin CA or super glue is practically designed for this purpose. It wicks into every crack and joint, no problem. Some of you may know that CA glue is brittle though. And I have five guitars and one violin that show no adhesion issues from this method. Just make sure your strips fit nicely so there aren't large gaps for the glue to fill. Don't glue yourself to the board. <laughs> For this task specifically, please don't use accelerator. Not only does it make the glue more brittle, but it can turn the glue white. And this is not a good characteristic if you have white lines in between your ebony and your brass. After a full night's cure time, I can sand this inlay flush with a hard sanding block and a belt sander. I would skip the belt sander because even with a careful hand, I still made depressions in the wood that inevitably needed to be sanded out by hand later. And I'm not using my drum sander because these panels are connected with the inlay at this point, which will point us towards the problem that we will uncover. No, it's not this part. Cutting them apart is really no problem. Easy peasy. And I even got a tiny defect on the side where the CA glued the two boards together. No problem there either, I can just clean that right up. 
The unfortunate problem is that they no longer line up perfectly on the diagonal from the lost kerf. I should have seen this coming. Anytime I work with angles, I have to pay close attention because things can get wonky. And this time I missed it, but I learned. Luckily, I always finish one inlay through to the end before I continue because lessons are always learned. So the second section is cut with the panels tightly together. Then I do a thorough check to make sure all of my grooves fit the inlay. Then I can pull the barrier and continue to the next table leaf. Go exceedingly slow where the patterns overlap because I actually have a piece blow off but once again, no problem. I take a breath and fix it the right way. Much better. The two main table panels also need to line up, and they do, so that's a relief. By the way, the alignment pins are installed on these panels. That's how I'm able to line them up each time. If they aren't installed first, you will likely have a hard time keeping things aligned later. Now each side of the pattern can receive its inlays individually. Then the ends can be filed flush for a quick OCD check of alignment. Another easy way to flush them faster is on the spindle sander. Then refine with a sanding block. The overlap parts are the hardest because they consist of smaller sections of curved inlay with pretty steep miters. But slow and steady wins the race. Everything is cut and shaped like before. I'm paying close attention to what overlaps and what underlaps so I don't break the pattern. I'll tell you though, being able to dry fit everything then glue later is much easier than working with messy epoxy. Get the joints nice and saturated. I used one full two ounce bottle of Thin CA on this project and I will leave links to all of the products that I use in the description below. If you are inlaying a softer or more porous wood, I suggest sealing it with shellac or a clear top coat before routing your grooves. This will help prevent the CA from staining your porous tabletop. Since the leaves are small enough to send through the drum sander, it's going to make the flushing process much faster. Just clean off any glue globs on the bottom first. Just to be safe, I'm only using the drum sander to get them close to flush. I've had too many bad experiences with things getting caught midway through, and the drum leaves a nasty mark that has to be sanded out. It's safer for me to finish things off by hand. Watch how much heat you create. Metals get very hot and no matter what glue you use, you don't want to destroy the bond at this point. And there they are, in all their glory. But we still have one more important step. I'm hooking the five sections together and spraying out any dust from the voids or joints. Lightly sealing that area of the top with the final finish I plan on using will be a good test for potential reactivity with the brass, as well as sealing just the wood because we're going to do one more pass with the CA glue. For any larger voids, I'm using the medium thick black Starbond CA followed by one last flood coat of the tight bond thin CA. This seal coat also shows me if there is any leftover staining that I will eventually have to sand out on my final sanding. I wish I could share with you just how amazingly flat this is. There's a difference between smooth and flat, and the good news is this is going to look amazing with finish on it. The bad news is that I have four more to do. Hopefully I earned your subscription, and here's another awesome video to watch.